Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lauren Manier and I am a senior program associate with the Inclusive STEM Ecosystems for Equity and Diversity program at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I work on our AAAS IUS initiative, which is hosting today's workshop, Implementing Active Learning in Undergraduate STEM Courses. We are excited to hear from today's presenters, Dr. Jessica Rosenberg and Dr. Wendy Smith. Before we jump into the workshop, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes. This presentation is being recorded and a recording and the slides will be made available in the coming days on our website at aaas-ius.org. You will also receive an email to the presentation recording when it is available. Please note we will transition into discussion breakout rooms following the presentations and these breakout rooms will allow for deeper engagement and they will not be recorded. Additionally, we have closed captioning for today's workshop. You can download and view the full transcript by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. For those of you who are new to the AAAS IUS initiative, this initiative seeks to support faculty, students, and the greater undergraduate STEM education community by disseminating research and knowledge about STEM teaching, learning, equity, and institutional transformation. We invite you to learn more about our initiative on our website, and we hope that you will join our community as future contributors. You can also follow us at AAAS IU's program on Twitter and on LinkedIn to stay up to date on our latest events, blogs, or to share what you've learned at today's workshop. Now I want to call your attention to our call for submissions for workshop presenters and blog authors for the 2022 calendar year. If you enjoy our workshops and have a great idea for a topic that you would like to see feature next year, then check out our call for submissions, which is open now through November 21st. And for more information, you can visit our website, aaas-ius.org slash showcase your work. And now without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our first presenter for today, uh, Dr. Jessica Rosenberg. Dr. Rosenberg, over to you. Well, thank you for uh, introducing me and allowing me to come talk about some work that we've been doing. I'm Jessica Rosenberg from George Mason University, and I'll be talking about a project that we've been working on for the last few years uh, as part of an IU's transformation grant, building the culture of active learning through course-based communities of transformation. Um, and I'll talk about those course-based communities as we go. So, so I just wanted to introduce our team, a couple of whom are here today, but there've been a lot of people putting in effort and doing a lot of work on this project who deserve a lot of credit for the work being done here. Um, so I just wanna make sure that we acknowledge their work and their efforts. Um, and start with just an introduction to sort of why we're all here. And many of you are probably very familiar with this, but I think it, it's worth at least introducing it as we begin that one of the issues that we face, of course, is that a large fraction of students leave STEM. And this is drawn from the Chen and Soldner work 2013. If you look at the two left-hand groupings, it's looking at bachelor on the far left, bachelors who leave without a degree or certificate. The next one is those who switch to a non-STEM major. And what you can see is that about 20% of bachelor's degree pursuants um, leave without a degree or certificate and uh, you know 28 or so percent switched to a non-STEM major right with especially in terms of switching a much larger fraction of female students and black students switching to non-STEM majors than our male and white students um, along the way. And we see similar uh, things reflected when we look at associate's degrees at all. So we know these students are leaving, they're switching out of STEM majors. And if you go to the work by uh, Hunter et al from talking about leaving, a lot of those reasons have been reflected over the years, right? Both in this work and their earlier work, coming back to issues within their courses. Right, the challenges they face, especially in those early gateway courses with teaching, weed out effects, classroom experience that they face that sort of drives many of those students to switch majors in order to leave. And 
when we look at active learning in particular, right, we know that the failure rates and some of those things that are important in terms of that switching are much lower when you switch to active learning, that this is a much more effective way to help students learn, to help them stay then in those courses, in those majors and be successful. So this is from Freeman. These are large numbers of studies that have been put together where yeah, there are always a few outliers in terms of increasing failure rates, but by and large, all of the studies show decreasing failure rates when you use these techniques and the fraction of students who fail going way down. Um, so our goal as we pursued this project was to sort of take that framework and say, well, we know that these techniques are effective. We know that they're important for our students, but how do we get them ingrained into the, the culture of our departments, of our courses, especially for those large introductory courses for which we have thousands of students passing through them every year, right? These are the large courses that most of our students see and that we know make such a huge difference in their staying or leaving within STEM and the experience that they have while they're there. So the goals for this project were to use multi-generational teams, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later, what we mean by that, to spread the culture of active learning within STEM faculty and facilitate broad adoption of these techniques, right? That facilitating broad adoption was really key. And it's based on a grassroots approach with institutional support. So sort of bottom up and top down support for what we're doing to build that culture. Uh, we're working on studying the strategies to remove barriers and preparing the next generation of STEM educators by involving graduate and undergraduate students in what we're doing, which also relates back to that multi-generational teams piece that I talked about. So those were sort of the framing goals for the project. And so I wanna start with this idea of grassroots change because it's really key to what we're trying to do. And the idea is that for any effort, right, we have sort of our innovators and early adopters, those who are like, yep, yeah, this sounds great. We know this is a really important technique. We want to jump in and see what we can do and adapt it. Um, but it's about pulling along those others within the department, right, who maybe aren't the ones who are going to leap on board, who aren't the ones who, you know, without a little bit more pulling are going to try all of this out. And so really what we were doing is not picking the people who were standing up and necessarily saying, yep, this is what we want to do, but the courses and saying, these are the really key courses, whoever's teaching them, you know, how do we get them on board? And by doing that, because so many of the people engaged within our departments have some connection to those courses, actually ultimately spread it beyond, again, just this core a set of courses. So grassroots leadership tells us that effective tactics include you know, organization of these intellectual opportunities, providing professional development experiences, leveraging curricula and classroom as a forum, since that's what all of this is based on, right? This curriculum and classroom, and really working to change individual mindsets and perspectives, including campus leadership. So we're bringing along not just the faculty, but the leadership as well. And so for our project, all of these little colorful ellipses are sort of the pieces of this, this community of transformation leaders. So the people who are leading these efforts within each of the disciplines, uh, the faculty, GIs, which are really sort of our GTAs in this case, and learning assistants that are engaged in the effort, but then working across the departments and the disciplines in these cross communities of change, ultimately to get this more fully into department level integration and institutional level integration. So I wanted to pause there and get all of you to think for a second, you can use the chat, but what are the qualities of those change leaders? What will, you know, would you be looking for? And I'll talk a little bit about who ours are in a minute. But as you think about it for your institutions, you can put things in the chat. Let's see. Yeah, having a student-centered focus, absolutely. Resilient, yes. <laughs> I would agree strongly with that. Uh, willingness to adapt. 
Yeah. So passive and change, supportive listening. Yes, all of these are great. Um, and all of these are things, right, that we found. And I will certainly say that resilient, persistent, you know, willingness to kind of return and adapt and come back has been really important. And of course, doing this in the middle of the pandemic just amplifies the need for those kinds of characteristics in our change leaders uh, as we think about them. And I put up this picture to tell just a brief story of one of the faculty that I've worked with who was quite resistant to some of the efforts that we were putting in place and can't complain. Why are we doing this? You know, why do I have to do this, right? What, what's going on? Um, and then, you know, we had gotten, I had gotten these whiteboards to put in our recitations um, to sort of help with this effort and literally had put them there the day I left when we switched to online for the pandemic. I was, it was spring break, I was on campus, we'd just gotten them in, I piled them up in the classroom and then we left. <laughs> um, but this was this fall and she was actually using them with her students when a fire alarm went off. And there they were outside working on their little whiteboards doing things, which was great. So sometimes people do when they get a chance to kind of engage. Uh, get in there. So let me talk a little bit about the details of what we're doing and start with the fact that Mason is, you know, a large public, we're classified now as high, very high research activity university. Um, and so, right, this is often a challenge when you're trying to look at teaching implementation and what you do in these large enrollment intro courses. We're now in sort of the intro, an intro sequence in math, physics, and starting the semester in computer science, which is a couple thousand students a semester. So we're talking about a large number of students that, that pass through these courses. Math actually started this effort in 2019, physics in fall 2020, and again, just as fall computer science started this effort. And it's really based on this idea that the faculty have to determine what the emphasis is going to be. If they're going to buy in, if they're going to really engage in it, they're the, they need to kind of grapple with what's going to be done and how it's going to be done. And then we have leads in each discipline, each of these disciplines, to kind of help facilitate the effort, be those leaders. I, I'm the leader in the physics group um, on campus, and we have other leaders in math and computer science. And it all starts actually with an implementation workshop. And this is actually our computer science workshop this fall, which was had the added complication of doing it both in person and online, <laughs> mid pandemic, right? Ha navigating all of that. But we've started in general with this all day workshop. And the goal was in the morning to set up sort of the institutional stage, what the institution thinks is, is important, why it's important. In fact, the woman in the plum colored dress here is our head of teaching and learning, the director of um, teaching excellence in our teaching and learning center, uh, as well as right, our math lead and is there and I'm there as well as all of our computer science folks. And so why this is important to the university, why it's important to the discipline, sort of what active learning is. It turns out computer science actually has quite a bit of experience in this and has had some efforts ongoing that we're building on there. Um, and then the afternoon is about the faculty sitting down and thinking about what they're going to do, right? What this is going to look like for their department. And we found that there have been quite a few sort of common themes that have emerged as we've done this. Partially, I think, because they're the things that are sort of easiest to tackle, but also because as we're tackling them, the next group then says, oh, that makes a lot of sense and, and moves on. So there, because of that communication, it also has that. And the things that in general have been common to what we're looking at, what we're tackling is restructuring recitations, um, improving course coordination. And what I'll say is that, right, these are large enrollment courses and they're complex courses. They all have a lecture, they have a recitation-like component. Computer science happens to call them uh, labs. Physics also, in addition to recitation, has labs, right? So they're multi-component courses, lots of different instructors, lots of you know, different sections, both for lecture, for recitation, et cetera. So that coordination is really important. Um, and you know, so that ends up being really a key piece and something that gets focused on. 
We've also, so far, all, we're focused on building or borrowing materials that will support active learning. The fact that you need to have something to work with that you can actually hand to people and say, here, we're gonna make your life easier by giving you something to work with as we try to do this new thing. Um, just sort of letting them go has not been effective. And uh, providing GTA training and support, right? Again, an easy one where they're much more amenable often than our faculty um, while we're working with faculty as well. So, uh, all of that. So I wanted to, again, just pause there and say, you know, which of these themes are most resonant for you? What are they, you know, which are the ones that you're thinking about, worrying about? Um, i just briefly say, yes, all of these courses overlap in terms of the majors who find, who have to take them. And our courses range from, there are actually a couple of smaller sections, but most of them are 100 to 300. In, in size. We don't have rooms bigger than that. So in general, they're not bigger, but we have multiple sections of two to 300 in, in many cases. And GTA is graduate teaching assistant. But so in terms of thinking about uh, these pieces, think about which ones make the most sense for you. And I will uh, talk briefly about sort of, again, for under this rubric of each of our goals. And one of the things that you'll notice as we do that uh, is that, right, so we're talking about preparing our graduate and undergraduate students. For physics, it turns out that the graduate students are all in the lab. They're not in the recitations, they're not in the course. So in some sense, they're actually quite separated from the main part of the course that we were focusing on. Um, so we created a weekly seminar that's actually all physics and astronomy GTAs, not, the just, not just the ones associated with the course that this effort was sort of focused on. Um, and those graduate students meet weekly to discuss issues in our classes, learn more about active learning, build community, talk about teaching. It's faculty led, I did it the last two years. We have another faculty who's teaching it this year. It's also written into their contracts. So they're actually required to do this as part of their graduate teaching requirement, you know, sort of what they're uh, contracted to do. Math sim has similar discussions there. It was just the GTAs who are working with Calc 1 and 2, and it's really focused on the efforts related to this course. Um, and sort of the redesign and the fact that those GTAs are teaching the recitations. For physics, it's actually faculty teaching the recitations. Math, it's the GTAs. And so, you know, helping the GTAs understand how to engage and do this active learning there is really important. And then we had to learn existing learning assistant seminar. So that's where the learning assistants are getting um, sort of their, some of their preparation. And so what we found as we look at this is that, you know, repeating discussions really helps solidify things for these GTAs that come in the first semester. We actually have a full year with them, which is nice because honestly, the first semester, they're just trying to you know, get through it. If they're drinking through a fire hose and you get to the second semester and you repeat something and it's as though you never said it because they're like, wait, they're so underwater. They're just trying to survive. And a lot of the things that they're getting out of that first semester are just the specifics. How do I do X? How do I manage a lot of the things that are going on? So it's really nice to be able to kind of come back and repeat. Um, for math, they've really found that uh, the GTAs can get uh, really a lot out of creating and executing some of these activities there, especially some of the returning ones taken leadership roles in the GTA training itself, which is great. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer discussions builds trust. The community piece is really important. And right, this is really important for future faculty if they're gonna understand active learning in the next generation. We really need to make sure that they're seeing it as their graduate students. So uh, the multi-generational team piece, I wanted to mention, this was sort of a centerpiece of what we had designed, right? These faculty, the graduate teaching assistants and the learning assistants all working together as part of this effort. One of the things I will say is it hasn't worked quite the way we'd hoped. It was a beautiful sort of integrated community we were going to build. And it turned out, right, especially because of the complexity of these courses, it doesn't work that way. 
for physics, the GTAs are off in lab. And that's totally separate from everything else going on in class. In math, you've got the lecture and then that's fairly separate from the recitations, which is where the GTAs are. You know, so again, you've got these different pieces and we're still working to build some of that integration, but it's not as central as we were hoping. We still try to find ways to implement it. And I will certainly say also the pandemic hasn't helped with that, right? Trying to pull different groups together that are otherwise a little disparate um, is hard. But they do, you know, the faculty are working with the graduate students um, in physics. The faculty are also working with the learning assistants, but not so much graduate students and learning assistants because they're just not in the same part of the class. Math, graduate students and learning assistants are working together, but less so with the groups of faculty who are in a separate part, uh, except for the faculty who are directly involved in leading their efforts. So um, other things that have come out of this are regular meetings of engaged faculty, both these are sort of our communities that have developed. Uh, in physics, it's a faculty. Math is alternating discussion. Uh, of their efforts with a seminar on education research, which is great. Um, but again, across generations, this can be hard. And in terms of the combination of this grassroots approach, right, this faculty-driven approach with institutional support, that institutional piece is really key. I mean, Mason has really put a lot of time effort words into building all of these beautiful rooms and you know creating spaces and creating an emphasis on this kind of work uh we'll say that some barriers you know as we've gone forward have increased to faculty even getting into those rooms which can be harder um and also the entire administration has changed even since this sort of goal of uh you know 30 percent of all classrooms being active learning classrooms and um, other pieces of this since we started. So we're constantly fighting the changing goals of our institution, um, which is an interesting challenge. And as part of that, right, this idea that we are diffusing from the core group who's focused on these classes through the department and the institution, right, as you have a changing institution, that's a real challenge. We've worked on this through having these active learning brown bags or regular meetings where we're pulling people from across campus to discuss some of these ideas led by people in a variety of different groups, but also from elsewhere on campus. The collabor collaboration between the leads of these communities, right, the math, the physics, and the computer science community has been really key. I work very closely with the math and computer science counterparts. Um, Again, these discussions with campus leadership, but that again gets hard, especially as they keep changing. Um, and the connection, similarly, the connection to institutional goals, right? That they're there, they're important to tie to, um, but it can be a moving target. And this comes back to that adaptability and resilience piece, I think, that came up earlier, that you know, sometimes a lot of the things you're doing are moving targets, which is uh, something to realize as we go through this. And so I just want to put up some final thoughts, right? Introduce, institutional and disciplinary norms really shape the path. As we're seeing, we have three different disciplines involved. The even the structure of our courses, right, in each of them is quite different. And that structure has been really important how this all gets implemented. While there are a lot of commonalities in the work that's being done, it looks somewhat different because, right, in physics, we've got labs, which is where the GTAs are, and we've got faculty in our recitation. So I'm working with peers, faculty peers, to try to get them to institute active learning and recitations um, <laughs> there, which is its own unique challenge, right? With math, they've got graduate students in their recitations, which is great, but then getting more faculty buy-in can be more of a challenge because they're not as deeply embedded within the effort. They have a few who are in the lectures that are related, but not as much. So it looks a little bit different there. And computer science is going to be a whole new uh, effort at scale just because of the number of students that they deal with. So we're really thinking with them how we implement this on a much, much larger scale where the numbers start to grow. So this is, I think, part of why having faculty buy-in and faculty thinking about how to implement this from the very beginning is so key, because those differences matter. 
And if we just sort of picked a model and set it down, um, I don't think we would have been making the progress that we are. Uh, helping graduate students is an easy gateway to improvement, right? That's often an easy first step that we've all identified. Uh, there are lots of different ways to do it, but um, there's too little of it being done in general, certainly on our campus, and I think on most campuses, um, and it can make a big difference. Uh, we've also found that, that the development of resources, whether it's taking others' resources or developing our own for physics. We found that developing our own was important to get buy-in from our faculty. Math has not had that same uh, problem. They've been able to borrow stuff and be quite effective, but having them is really important to supporting these efforts. And doing the work really highlights where coordination is needed, right? That, that coordination is so key. And so while it doesn't always feel like that coordination piece is as directly tied to building active learning and the culture of it, um, I've come to realize it's incredibly important to it. Without it, this, a lot of this can't happen. And the other point is, while you know, the pandemic and remote teaching made a lot of this harder, it also, we have found, allowed new leaders to emerge. Um, and this was particularly true for our math group that there were faculty who, you know, for a variety of reasons were not in leadership roles within their department, but because of their ability to navigate online, to actually move active learning type practice online and do it very effectively and help their peers do it, um, emerged as leaders, which has been really exciting to see and, and really nice for the project. And so I will stop there. These are the questions that we're gonna consider when we get to the breakout session, but I will stop sharing now and turn it over to Wendy. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Rosenberg. Um, we appreciate you being here today and sharing your insights and work with us. Um, we now like to turn it over to Dr. Wendy Smith. All right, thank you. So the um, AAAS kind of put us together. We didn't necessarily um, plan this together, but I think it's going to work pretty well. Um, so what Jessica was describing was, you know, grassroots and multiple departments in one university. And what I'm talking about is the seminal I use project, which is student engagement in mathematics through an institutional network for active learning, which has had a focus on mathematics departments, but across over 25 universities. Um, so, you know, similar, but then also different. So the goals of what I want to talk about are to talk about the change levers we've, we've found from the research, um, thinking about the role of policies in change efforts, thinking about you know, how systems thinking can help try to affect policy changes, and then there'll be time for discussion about how to apply the findings. So I'm not going to talk very long about the problem. Jessica did a great job of explaining the problem. Um, I will say that we have focused on calculus two and below for our seminal grant because 95% of students who are taking a, any college math class are taking calculus two or below. Um, within departments, it doesn't necessarily seem that way because we have so many other courses, but that really is where the students are. Um, and students switching away from STEM majors or math serving as gateway courses, these are problems and failing math correlates very highly with freshman dropout or lack of freshman retention, partly because um, most freshmen, more than half of freshmen take math and it's pretty rare that more than 20 or 25% of freshmen would take any other single class. Um, and so that is why you get the correlation. And that unfortunately beliefs and attitudes toward mathematics have this decreasing trajectory from kindergarten to graduate school, unfortunately. And we know a lot more, especially in the last couple decades, about how people learn. Um, we know that the way we have traditionally been teaching of having people read stuff, listen to lectures, or observe demonstrations, these are some of the least effective ways to engage people in learning. And that the more engaged people are, the more likely it is that we're setting them up to learn well. Um, so we ask ourselves, you know, how does this align with how we teach? And the answer comes back, you know, often, not well at all. We're, we're teaching it you know, exactly upside down. And before I go any farther, I want to have us think about what is active learning, and then I'll share the definition we're using, because active learning tends to have a really broad definition or multiple definitions. 
And so I want you to just think for a moment and then drop a phrase in the chat about one part of your definition of active learning. Not expecting paragraphs, um, not a full definition, but just think about what is something that comes to mind when you think about active learning. Yep, I see not lecturing, student driven, engagement. Yeah, students doing the work, figuring things out. Students might be talking, students might be uh, applying, engaged, cognitively engaged, productive struggle, experiential, motivation. Yep, sense you guys see a lot of things about students doing work, students doing things. Yep, there's practice, definitely, yeah, the opposite of passive. Learning, learning centered, yep. Yeah, problem solving, brain act, yeah. So yeah, definitely all of that. Um, the definition that our project has been using comes from um, Larson and Rasmussen, which this was published in 2019. Um, Chris Rasmussen is also one of our co-PIs. So we actually used a version of this definition back in 2016. Um, but we're when I talk about active learning, we're talking about teaching methods and classroom norms that promotes students' deep engagement. For us, it's in mathematical reasoning, but I think you can substitute in, you know, whichever, whichever STEM discipline you want or even not non-STEM, you know, students' deep engagement in the content, peer-to-peer -peer interaction, instructor interest in and use of student thinking in instruction, and instructor's attention to equitable and inclusive practices. We know that just putting students in groups does not automatically make things more equitable. In fact, if anything, it can automatically perpetuate implicit bias and make things more inequitable. Uh, so there needs to be an explicit attention to equity and inclusive practices. And Jessica talked a lot about what we know about how people learn, so I'm not going to dwell on this part. But one of the things about Seminole that is different than the project at George Mason is since we were focused not on necessarily on grassroots, but more about how do we change the culture of multiple departments across multiple institutions, we were thinking, we approach it from a systems thinking perspective because we said, this is a high dimensional problem and we can't just have a one dimensional solution or a two dimensional solution. Now, this is of course, similar to George Mason, which is not just trying one thing. Uh, so basically our approach to change is that you can't just do one thing and expect to change all your outcomes. In some sense, you practically have to do all the things. And so it's a, you know, how do you get this systemic approach? Um, and we are focused on cultural change, which is about the people involved, the power dynamics involved, the structures such as course coordination, just to name one, and then the collective beliefs. Um, so we had this kind of four pronged approach to how we're trying to shift the culture so that active learning is the norm instead of lecture as the norm. And then to do this process, we were focusing on a change process where people start off with, you know, what is the, what is the actual goal? Hopefully it is a student-centered goal and an equity-focused goal. Um, and then understanding what is, what is the system involved? Who are the people? What are the power dynamics? What strategies are you going to try? How are you going to measure your, your change? Because not all change is an improvement, as we all know. And so how are you going to measure what you're doing and decide if it is actually an improvement? Then you need to obviously do it, measure what happened, and then decide what you are doing next. And with all of this, you know, we're, we're assuming that, you know, we need to start with developing a common vision of what is success. So we're all working toward the same thing. We need a lot of different relevant stakeholders involved in and outside the department. Change is very complex. It can't just be a simple thing or one dimensional thing. We, uh, we called our kind of change age, we call people change agents who are these leaders who are really promoting and pushing the change, keeping it a priority. And since we were focusing on math departments, mathematical rigor was important to us. So the seminal project, um, we're actually in our no-cost no extension year. This started in 2016 as a collaborative research grant between APLU, the associate, which is the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, and the University of Colorado, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where I'm one of the PIs, and San Diego State University. Uh, we have too many people to list on one slide, uh, but we have lots and lots of people involved from all of these universities and more. Uh, we've had three phases of the work, which has involved six cases of retrospective change of departments that have sustained culture changes that we're talking about. 
We had nine cases where we were able to give them small sub awards to try to provide some funding to help launch their changes. And then 12 other cases of changes that weren't involved in the funding that were involved in trying to be networked with each other or network with other people and make changes. And then we also had a recent handbook published by the American Mathematics Society um, this year. But our goal of Seminal is to really understand how do you enact and support institutional change to implement active learning in undergraduate math environments. We did a lot of data collection and I'm not going to go very deeply into this. I'll just mention that the departments involved did self studies to provide a lot of documentation. Uh, we collected a lot of local data, which was pre-calculus to calculus two, that's that acronym of P2C2, about student demographics, grades, um, course taking trajectory, students did surveys, instructors of these courses did linked surveys, um, we observed courses, and then we did lots of interviews um, from administrators and department leaders to people like provosts and deans of undergraduate education, including, and then down to students, learning assistants, other instructors. Um, and in, I see a few things in the chat there. Are, the, these slides are being shared with everybody. And at the end, I have a bunch of links that are on these slides that will have all of the important links you need for the handbook and such. Um, when we started off, we had this beautiful, nice, simple model of seeing the system. We thought about students who are in classrooms with instructors, and there's you know, the department around that, the institution around that. Um, and of course, all models are simplifications, and we discovered this one was too much of a simplification. Things are far messier than this. And in particular, we narrowed in by looking at the department and the classroom level networks. And we realized that the department, it's about the leadership, which is about you know, the, not just the department chair, but other people who have formal and informal roles of leaders in the department. It's about the course coordinators. It's about physical resources like time, um, you know, classroom space, classroom renovation. It's about an instructional commitment to active learning. Uh, it's about instructional support like learning assistance and other student supports such as learning centers. It's about the training and professional development given for instructors and learning assistants. It's about access to data and then using that data to actually figure out what's happening. It's about how students get placed in courses and it's about having faculty in charge of this, not as one person, but as a committee or a task force that can oversee and sustain the changes. And so some of the main findings out of all this research that have come out, when institutions have managed to sustain this kind of cultural change, we see that they have an institutional and community identity about we are the kind of people who engage students actively and focus on equity. There's a campus culture that values teaching innovation. You know, people are rewarded for this on promotion, tenure, and annual review. There are teaching awards. Um, there are regular incentives like internal grants you can get to improve teaching. There's usually a center for teaching excellence or teaching and learning. Um, there are effective leaders involved who are perhaps opportunistic to be able to tie what they're doing onto university goals or strategic plans um, or to capitalize on a goal like student retention and be able to leverage that to get resources for the department. And there's a willingness to pay the cost of improved instruction. Uh, improving teaching is not just free. At the very minimum, it costs people's time, which is very precious. And if you're in a place that says everything is valued, but really promotion is only about research, then it's really hard to justify asking people to spend time on this. Um, it's about coordination of the multi-section courses, just like Jessica said super important to have that kind of coordination that goes beyond a common textbook and syllabus to conversations about the content, about assessment, you know, common grading of common assessments, that kind of thing. Um, sufficient support. It's not enough to tell people, you should stop lecturing and do active learning. You know, I've seen things in the chat, you all know this, but, but that actually needs to be said. It can't just be that you tell people, stop doing what you're doing and do something different. Um, it takes flexibility because things change and you've got to be ready to change, you know, with the data when you get data, actually use it. And then plan for the succession. Um, there is going to be turnover at a very minimum. There's turnover in who is teaching specific courses from semester to semester. But in pretty much every institution across five years, there's new department chairs, new deans, new provosts, new course coordinators. So there needs to be a specific plan for what you are going to do to get new people on board with what you're doing. 
Um, so that was kind of the findings out of the places that it sustained changes. The universities that were trying to enact changes across the life of our project, we saw that when they were trying to change their cultures, things that they did were initiating and expanding course coordination of these large multi-section courses with a focus on assessment, you know, not just on materials, but also assessments, um, especially when you're going for equity. Having common assessments and common grading of those assessments with rubrics is a really important equity kind of finding. Um, they focused on hiring. Many of them were able to create positions for course coordinators, or they started hiring undergraduate learning assistants to help, particularly in large lectures. And as they focused on hiring new instructors, this idea of actually asking potential, you know, hirees, what are your, you know, how, what is your teaching style? Do you mostly lecture? How do you engage students actively? You know, here we have this coordination system. How would you work in this system? So actually taking those values and using it as a filter to hire people. There's a huge focus on instructor professional development and supporting people in, engage, in engaging students with active learning strategies. A big focus on local data and using it, especially around course placement, but also on outcomes. Um, developing and adapting active learning tasks and materials. It is great to start not from scratch. And so we did a lot of sharing across departments, but there's also very much value in having instructors look at tasks together as a group and think about how to adapt them to the local situation and local students that helps create buy-in, um, which can include culturally responsive teaching, adapting to the context that are most relevant. And then this explicit planning for sustainability. Uh, so when we combine all of the change levers, we you know, these are kind of the, the main levers we found, which I'll talk about briefly, but it's in this involvement of everyone from students to, you know, provosts and presidents. So it's not just the responsibility of one person, uh, but it includes the chairs of the department, faculty task forces, course coordinators, math ed researchers or other STEM education researchers who can help make sense of the data, as well as the instructors who are doing so much of this work. And so I wanna just talk very briefly about some of these main points. And so the use of data, um, it can be very hard to get access to a university data system. Um, it took us six months and that was with them trying to be cooperative and help us have access to things. But having access to data and not just, you know, passing rates or failure rates, but course taking trajectories, grades and next courses, um, if you're at all thinking about mathematics, try to get access to your data that says when you get an A, B, or a C or lower in Calculus 1, what happens in Calculus 2? Because nationally, if you get a C in Calc 1, less than a third of the students pass Calc 2, which is a big issue, just as one small piece. Um, you might want to think about student surveys, which we have some out there published. Um, you might want to be interviewing people. There's no substitution for actually hearing and talking with students and instructors who are living this. Um, you might want to observe or engage in peer observation as a way of faculty professional development and support. And thinking about these common assessments and you know, looking at them, seeing what students struggle with, where students are successful and using it to inform your teaching. With the leadership, um, getting the department chair committed to the efforts, we have found that, a, a, well, obviously a negative department chair can hinder efforts, but even a neutral department chair is not enough to expand beyond whatever core group of faculty start, start the changes. It really needs somebody who is proactive, who will help push it to scale it up and spread it to a whole department. Um, and aligning the change efforts to a university's efforts or strategic plan is really important to get resources. And having coordinators who don't just change every single semester to get some of that continuity going and institutional memory has been important. Obviously the active learning is important. You know, we, we've been focused on departmental change. And so we think a lot about the policies and the people and the belief systems, but the actual you know, materials and what we're asking students to do, how we teach students how to work in groups collaboratively in ways that can improve equity instead of you know, decrease the equitable outcomes. These are all important. And one of the things we've had to be pretty clear about is that when we're talking about active learning, we're not saying, don't ever tell students anything. Clearly sometimes there are times where you just have to tell students something and then have them engage in working and exploring and inquiry, that kind of thing. Um, 
And I will say that across all of our places, we've had some kind of small universities that have a lot of classes that are under 20. We also have some that are big and have 800 student lecture sections. And active learning does not look the same when you have 25 students or over 100 students, but you can still do it. Um, it just looks different in terms of things like in the larger sections, doing things like clicker questions and having people just turn to somebody near them rather than having students all go to the board kind of thing. Uh, and the, these instructional materials, uh, all of the departments we work with that have sustained things have developed some kind of common course activities and shared materials, um, shared folders that, in, that are not just static, but ones that instructors actively seek to improve as they use them over time. Um, like I said, common assessments, which is not just homework, but also exams, common grading. Um, and the textbooks, the open educational resources, there are more um, active learning kind of ones out there. There's active calculus and some other ones that people use. Um, and then instructional materials are also about the messaging to students and instructors, because just changing up, if students are expecting to sit quietly in a lecture and then you don't do that, um, disrupting expectations is a negotiation and takes some intentionality so that students don't get super grumpy about the way the course is being taught. Uh, course coordination, I've already talked about a little bit, but having things not just, you know, common textbook, but, you know, common repository where people can access active learning activities and instructor notes about what went well or what to do. And having instructor meetings that, of course, include the nuts and bolts, um, but also talk about, you know, what are the misconceptions? What are some good examples to do when you're trying to use this concept? How are ways to engage students? What are good questions to ask students? So getting at the teaching and not just the nuts and bolts. The professional development and support is extremely important and it can't just be one shot. It needs to be ongoing. So instructor meetings that have these conversations can be part of the professional development. But maybe the department, many departments have some kind of you know, research colloquium as a regular set of speakers. So maybe there's a department teaching seminar where people have conversations about teaching. The Mathematics Association of America's Instructional Practices Guide, there's a toolkit around that. That's a great thing to structure to start off a um, department teaching seminar in mathematics. And maybe there's travel to workshops around inquiry-based learning. There are many workshops about that. In the chat earlier, people were mentioning Pogol. There are Pogol workshops. Um, and maybe there, and then also, what is the course for graduate student instructors or learning assistants to learn how to teach? Uh, and learn how to teach in ways that you don't take away the thinking from students, but how do you ask student questions to help them reason and think and be actively involved? Um, one instructor kind of mentioned that, you know, it's tempting to just be authoritative and, you know, it's like, okay, I can just tell you the right way to do this, but then that removes the ownership of the knowledge from the students. And so when you're focusing on active learning, then you need to work on encouraging students to build their own knowledge and to be actively engaged. Uh, something else we found is really important is an instructor community of practice where the instructors have these conversations and it's very normal to have not just you know, a research group, but to have a teaching group where you have conversations about teaching and learning and give advice and get advice from each other and have teaching mentors, that kind of thing. Um, learning assistants are typically undergraduates who can support group work, especially in classes over about 30. It's really hard for one instructor to support lots of students working in groups, um, but they need to be trained in how to support students with active learning. They need to you know, meet and have time to reflect just like other instructors. Um, in some places they've been recruited from math majors. In others places, they actually just recruit it from students in courses with a learning assistant. You finish Calc 1 and you did pretty well with it, we'll recruit you to be a Calc 1 learning assistant while you're taking Calc 2. Um, some places have actually found this kind of work as a learning assistant is an effective way to recruit people to become math teachers. Um, and then the learning environment. Now, I will say, if you have to do this in a lecture hall that seats 800 and everything is bolted, you can absolutely do active learning, but it is easier if you have a smaller room that has tables and chairs that move and lots of whiteboard space or blackboard space. 
Um, and then the other part of the learning environment is more time. Several, not lots, but several of the campuses involved were able to get more time to change 50 minute classes three times a week into 75 minute classes three times a week and basically argue to treat it like, um, like a science lab that might be one credit hour, but meet for three hours in a week to say, you know, giving students more time to grapple with the concepts can lead to better outcomes. Um, so I promised some resources. So the seminal book, the handbook that got published looks like this, and there's a link here. Um, there's also a journal called Primus, which focuses on undergraduate mathematics. And there was a special issue um, very recently that tells the story actually of 26 different articles of 26 different departments um, that started this process of change. And actually I'll say that um, George Mason is one of those 26 articles. Um, and one of the things this special issue was focused on is that when you are um, learning, when you're trying to get started changing, talking to a department that has been changed for 35 years is actually not that helpful because the people who did the initial changes are not there anymore. And so the focus of this special issue was really on departments in the first couple years of change. How do you get this started? Um, and then other useful resources, the, there's an accelerating systemic change network that has a change dashboard, which is a pretty interesting tool to use, and then also a free um, PDF version of a book about transforming institutions of higher education. Um, there is also um, increasing student success in STEM is a very practical, it's got a lot of checklists and inventories. So if you're a kind of a checklist person, you might like um, that one by Elrod and Kizar. Um, and then there's also a parallel project to Seminole called Teaching for Prowess, which is the same kind of project focused on two-year colleges. Um, and their website is there. That project is pretty new. There are lots of ways for continued engagement. The Accelerating Systemic Change Network also is a network of people that you can join. Um, the Commit Network is about communities of practice um, around mathematics teaching. Um, the Mathematics Association of America has an, this MAA Connect, which has a lot of groups, including an active learning group you can belong to. AMATIC is the American Mathematics Association for two-year colleges, which has similar communities, including an active learning focus. And then um, MSRI, the Mathematics Science Research Institute, has a critical issues in math education conference every year. The 2021 one was somewhat, you know, canceled from COVID. It was online, but there is an in-person in 2022 that the most, the most of the organizers are from the Seminole project. So that's what I wanted to kind of share with you. We have these discussion questions that we'll be talking about in small groups momentarily. Great, thank you so much, Wendy. Um, we are now going to transition into facilitated breakout rooms. Great, welcome back everyone. Thank you for sticking around for the breakout room discussions. We hope you had a productive discussion with your room. I'm wondering if we can get our speakers and facilitators to share a quick one minute recap of what their group talked about. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Jessica first. Sure, so we had a really nice discussion that ranged quite a bit. Um, one of the things that was pointed out that I thought was really useful and interesting was when thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, how important it is to sort of start there before launching into some of these efforts to set the stage and make sure that that's sort of at the base of the work that we're doing. Um, we also had some discussion about the, just the time it takes to put all of these pieces together, right? From the sort of simple of just starting active learning, starting simple, trying something small to actually these efforts that are across departments, you know, single departments and multiple departments that again, it takes time to to pull all of these pieces together, you know, you know and sort of spring up with uh, these things all formed and sort of tackling little bits at a time is really key. Um, there's also some discussion about getting buy-in through bringing in experts, people who your faculty will trust, will sort of take seriously to talk about why active learning is important and can in, sort of make positive change for the students. Um, and just having peers, people to work with, people to support the efforts as you try to do this from learning centers to peers across disciplines to others that 
you know, as you make these changes, it's challenging. So having other people to talk to and work with is really useful. So I will stop there. Awesome. Sounds like a great conversation. I'm wondering if I can get um, Phoebe to share a little bit about what her group talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we had a really um, diverse group in terms of active learning, lots of people who were new to active learning, but lots of people who had experience with active learning as well. Um, so we had a really great discussion. Um, in regard to levers for change, uh, we talked about how a core group of faculty who want to make changes happen is absolutely essential uh, to implementing active learning, but also changing our ideas and beliefs around what education is, what society has taught us education is, um, is also really important as well. Um, there are definitely a lot of challenges that were uh, identified, especially in regard to online teaching and learning, um, as I'm sure everyone knows already. Um, but specifically managing time in a hybrid or online settings, um, trying to hop between groups, trying to manage students who are in person or online. Um, and the cultural shift of all of this, is it takes a lot of time. Um, so that was a challenge as well. Um, and we also talked about how there's a lot of effort on the faculty side and a lot of time has to go into that initially. But we also talked about possible solutions to these challenges, which included um, teaching staff, as well as celebrating innovative teaching by giving awards um, kind of as a motivator for that. And then in regard to sustainability, we talked about um, how we can really make these changes sustainable. And that's by documenting the resources that we develop so that other people can see and use those um, and making those available to the public um, and to other people, as well as sharing data that show the impact of active learning and making that available for educators and students as well. Awesome, thank you so much, Phoebe. I'm glad you were able to hit on some of those solutions and making um, the change sustainable. I'll turn it over to Julie. All right, um, we we didn't talk specifically about uh, the the questions um, about the levers for change, um, but we did talk about um, what we um, did talk about some some barriers and challenges, and some of that is um, time, uh, as has already been mentioned. Um, sometimes the space is a challenge, just being able to to figure out how to get maybe students to work together. Um, but you know, there's other ways to just add, to engage the students, and really, that's that's the big thing is getting the the students engaged um, and build their confidence, especially in those lower level courses. So, um, figuring out ways to to get the students to um, maybe shift that mindset from yeah, I really I really hate math, like math, for instance, I really hate math. How do you get them to shift that that mindset? Um, and and get some get some wins under their belt, and so they they can figure out, yeah, I can really do this. Um, and we talked a lot about um, and and you know we had some folks who've been doing active learning for a long time and lo looking for new ideas on different things that they can do in their classrooms um, to 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 facilitate active learning. Um, so we talked to talked about some of the everybody kind of shared some of the active learning activities that they've been using. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Wendy. Yeah, so our group, um, there we go. Our group talked uh, about a lot of different things. So we talked some about the importance of leadership and be, having proactive leaders is, is kind of a lot of times what it takes to move from one or a small group of passionate people who change to spread it to a whole department. Uh, we also kind of veered off and talked about um, you know, getting funding and getting NSF grants and, you know, external evaluators, but we had some good conversation about um, what it takes to kind of focus this on a department and get things going and what kind of resources are needed um, in terms of, you know, buying out people's time or summertime or just people time in order to make changes and sustain them. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sounds like a great discussion. Um, Rachel, if you're on the line. Uh, would you like to share what your group discussed? Yeah, so we also um, touched on a lot of different things, especially the challenge of getting buy-in from various stakeholders um, when trying to make change. And one thing that we started honing in on was the importance of getting buy-in from students um, and different core structures that support active learning. So, for example, one of our group members shared that uh, essentially branding is really important. So they talked about how instead of calling things office now, 
office hours, now they call them workshops and a workshops um, that focuses on a particular like concept that they've identified as important for students to know as a way to get um, more students to come to office hours. Um, we also shared how important it can be to share data with students um, so that students, uh, for example, about data about how students who engage with the course in these particular ways, um, how that impacted their performance in the course as a whole, sharing this type of data can be important from getting buy-in for students. Um, we also talked a lot about how important learning objectives are when guiding and creating assessments, um, talked a little bit about mastery grading as well. Awesome. Sounds like a great discussion. And lastly, turn it over to Antonio. Great, thank you. And so our group talked about uh, lots of interesting things as well. Uh, one of the more interesting uh, topics that we spent a little time on was this idea of department culture and what is and what the messaging is in, in, in your department. And uh, for a few people in our group, it was more of a the department sort of had this pride about uh, failing a certain number of students or making sure that the GPA did not, uh, was maybe uh, the average GPA was 2.8. Um, and so there was a sense of pride in, in failing students, whereas other departments, there was uh, messaging and initiatives in place to improve student success. And so really, uh, and Wendy sort of uh, alluded to this earlier in terms of um, the types of leaders that you have in your department and who is uh, leading this, these changes is, is super important. Um, and uh, something else we talked about was uh, uh, making these changes, uh, especially for pre-tenure faculty can be really difficult. And so having the support and community uh, and building those relationships with others to, to sort of uh, to build a supportive community and making these changes is also really important. Awesome, thank you so much. It sounds like very productive discussions all around. Um, so before we go, I wanted to say thank you to our presenters and facilitators, as well as the rest of the AAAS IUS team and all of you who were able to join us for the workshop today. 